Thanks for inviting me to speak about the health of mixed species eucalypt forests. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands of this uh, research, the Jajawarang, uh, Wurundjeri and Gunai Kurnai people, and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Much of my uh, research is supported by the Integrated Forest Ecosystem Research Program funded by DECA. So that's a key program supporting ongoing forest research in Victoria. So supported also by other funding sources listed there. And I'd like to um, acknowledge my colleagues at the University of Melbourne, DECA and ARI, and particularly graduate researcher students, research staff and uh, early career researchers for allowing me to talk today about their hard work. So the title of this talk is Looking Out for the Health of Mixed Species Eucalypt Forests. But what do we mean by healthy? Uh, there are many interpretations. This is just one from Western science from the 1990s, that a healthy forest is one that maintains its organisation and autonomy over time and is res resilient to stress. And that health has three main components. Vigour, represented by productivity. Organisation, represented by structure and biodiversity and resilience, which they suggest is the ability to maintain vigour and organisation through quick recovery from stress. And why might we be interested in mixed species eucalypt forests? Well, as a very broad forest type, they are the most extensive in Victoria, occupying over 50% of the um, public land by area. And because of that, they provide many of our forest-based ecosystem services. They include a range of ecological vegetation classes and so support much of our forest-based biodiversity. And they also seem to be quite tolerant. So the dominant trees are renowned for their capacity to re-sprout after even the most severe fires. That lovely green that you see along charred stems in the aftermath of a bushfire, that's re-sprouting. Can we rely on this tolerance to sustain their health in coming years, given Predictions in Victoria of a hotter and drier climate characterised by more intense rain events, more dangerous fire weather, and leading to expectations of more frequent and more severe bushfires. So I wanted to check in on the health of the mixed species eucalypt forest and examine the potential influences of these climate and fire changes on their health, so their vigour, organisation, resilience, through the lens of some of our recent research. Starting with heat and its potential influence on vigour in the form of gross primary productivity. So gross primary productivity is essentially the total carbon that a forest fixes from the atmosphere through photosynthesis. And it's a fundamental process because it provides the energy for all the interconnected organisms in a forest. And here's some key statements by work done by Alison Bennett and Anne Griebel in their PhD studies based on data from eddicovariance flux sites, like the one you see there on the left in the Wombat Forest near Dalesford. And so on the top of those towers, we have instruments that measure carbon fluxes above the forest can canopy. And from that, we can estimate gross primary productivity. So Alison assessed the relationships of gross primary productivity with temperature for uh, 17 wooded ecosystems around Australia as part of the eddy covariance um, network of sites and found that gross primary productivity of eucalypt forests adjusts with the local mean daytime temperature and also that small increases in that mean of at least one degrees would have minimal influence on gross primary productivity of those forests. So some buffer there in the system to at least moderate warm, warming. And also found um, some tolerance of heat in the mixed species eucalypt forest at that wombat site, in that the forest was, um, could maintain its gross primary productivity throughout a five day heat wave in 2014. And it appeared to do that by using more water to cool its leaves. So from these studies, we might say, Maybe the eucalypt forest will be okay just with hotter conditions alone. But at least in the case of the wombat study, we're not really sure about these combinations of hotter and drier because in Anne's study, the trees appeared to have sufficient water to get through the heat wave. They weren't water stressed. 
Certainly though, we need stronger understanding of how chronic drying might influence productivity and vigour of these forests. But we also need to keep an eye on um, temperature, heating in particular, because our other work in the Wombat State Forest has shown that temperature is a really important influence on stem growth. So that's the expansion of stems. Uh, and in temperate Australia, our eucalypts don't put down regular growth rings because they grow quite opportunistically in their stems. So we have to look at their growth or monitor their growth using things like band dendrometers. So what you see there up in the top, top photo, a metal band with a spring on it, we come back at regular intervals to, to look at the, measure the change, quantify the change in the diameter of the stem. And I'd like to thank Julio Nehera for collecting each of these points that you see here in these graphs. So these points represent a single tree's growth over a month. And the different colours representing different seasons. We have Eucalyptus oblique on the left, Eucalyptus rubida on the right. Tree basal increment is essentially that that stem expansion, increase in diameter as area. Against maximum mean temperature, and what you can clearly see is that growth increases to an optimum and then decreases beyond that optimum. So um, perhaps we'll say if we have more increases in maximum mean temperatures, maybe we'll have periods of lesser stem growth. But uh, there are many things that um, stem growth in eucalypts respond to. And another thing here was autumn rainfall. So with less autumn rainfall, we had less stem growth in both autumn and spring. So again, emphasising the importance of looking out for these combinations of hotter and drier conditions together. There may be ways to um, relieve any climatic stresses on stem growth by relieving tree-to-tree -tree competition. So this is data analysed by Ella Plumens Putin during a research project. And again, on the vertical axis, we have that increment in growth, but this is for a whole season. And we have the different seasons, uh, um, going from left to right, summer to spring, plotted against the competition index of each of these individual trees. So a dot is a tree's growth over a season, and on the horizontal axis, it's competition relative to trees around it. And straight away you see that the, there's most potential for growth in autumn and in spring, so the highest values on the vertical axis. So these trees grow, like I said before, opportunistically when the conditions are good. In autumn and spring it's not too hot, not too cold, there's usually sufficient water. You can also see though with competition from an adjoining trees, growth decreases in autumn and spring. The line is much flatter and less convincing in summer, and that's because things other than competition are limiting growth in summer. Things like lack of water and uh, perhaps higher temperatures. And so what we might say from this is that reducing competition between trees is likely to improve growth during the good times. So the trees get larger faster if you relieve that in inter-tree competition. It's not so much about relieving and improving growth during the lean times, but perhaps getting faster, uh, larger faster will help with persisting during lean times because those larger trees might have deeper roots to access things like water. So at least in these types of forests where the stocking is quite high, there may be some potential to open up the forest to improve vigour in the form of at least stem growth. But there's opening up and there's opening up and sometimes things can go a bit far. As happened in the wombat forest in, the, um, in 2021, when we had two extreme wind throw events. So you see here the town of Barkstead in December 2020 and then again in December 2021. Definitely too much opening up happening there. From using these kinds of images um, and led by Nina Hinka Nehera and Paul Bentley, we've been able to construct a map of wind throw severity based on satellite imagery. And you see that there, the most intensively impacted areas in red with very considerable decreases in canopy cover. So we've estimated that about 35,000 hectares or 75% of the Wombat State Forest was impacted by wind throw in some way, a thousand hectares of that severely, so with greater than 50% reduction in canopy cover. 
And this is what it looked like on the ground. Definitely uh, severe thinning out of standing stems and a lot of fallen wood on the ground. So windstorms are a part of the historical disturbance regimes for these forests, at least out in the west. Um, but we think this might be the most extensive on record. And it's not clear how wind might change with climate, but um, strong winds are often associated with rain-bearing systems, as these two were, these storms, and more intense rainfall events are forecast for Victoria. And so it's likely that we're going to have to anticipate dealing with these kinds of intense shocks to forest health in coming years. And in some ways, we're accustomed to seeing quite severe sort of images in mixed species eucalypt forests. So this is after high severity fire in Gippsland. But they're less of an issue because uh, we, we get quick recovery usually. So the trees, most of the trees remain standing for one thing, and many of them resprout, the majority of them resprout successfully. Can we rely on this reliable resprouting into the future? Perhaps not always. So this is work from Yugendra Khanna's PhD, and Yugendra assessed the recovery of mixed species eucalypt forests after Black Saturday and the Kilmore Murrindindi fire. Uh, he used aerial LIDAR data and analysed it in quite some, data, um, quite some detail to look at the individual crowns and also the, the forest canopy. As it's recovered nine years, has it recovered nine years after Black Saturday? And you'll see there, he found quite persistent changes in the canopy of these resprouting trees. So much more cylindrical, elongated crowns there, nine years after high severity fire, relative to the much more complex and rounded crowns of unburned forest. So we're not sure how this might influence the productivity of these forests, but we did assess the carbon stocks five years after Black Saturday in the same forest type and found um, decreased carbon stocks in these mixed species eucalypt forests after high severity fire, and that was largely associated with tree mortality. So on the vertical axis here, we have the percentage of standing trees that are dead. You go from left to right, the tree size classes. So 10 to 20 centimetres diameter, going up to the larger size, trees that were over 70 centimetres diameter. And the white bars are unburned forest, the light grey, low severity forest uh, fire, where the fires did not burn the canopies, and the dark grey, high severity, where the crowns were pretty much consumed. And what you see straight away, indicated by the asterisks, is that there is um, significantly higher mortality after high severity fire in all tree size classes. This is five years after the fire. But you can also see in the, the white, it's particularly for that smaller size class, which had 93% mortality after the high severity fire, about more than 30% mortality in the unburned forest. And we believe, so high baseline mortalities for these forest types going into Black Saturday, and we believe that was associated with the millennium drought, which was for eight years before Black Saturday. So what we can say is that high severity fires um, plus straight drought can kill resprouting eucalypts. But there was some good news in that after high severity fire, there was also prolific, prolific seedling regeneration, so from seed. So there was some renewal there of the forest after high severity fire, which is a good thing if those seedlings um, survive long enough or get big enough to survive the next fire. And as similar to David's map earlier on, this is a map that we produced in January 2020 showing the um, initial distribution of the black summer fires. Um, overlain here with preceding landscape scale fires. So the different colours, for example, orange indicates that they were burnt twice, that area burnt twice within 20 years red twice within just 10 years, and then the pink and the purple burnt three times within 20 years or three times within 10 years. So these are very short intervals um, based on the historical fire regimes for all of these forests. And we know that short interval wildfires are, are not good for obligate cedar forests dominated by ash, for, uh, ash trees, mountain ash, the alpine ash, 
but we, they're also not that great for um, mixed species eucalypt forests. As Tom Fairman established in his PhD work in um, Gippsland, examining the recovery of mixed species forest, this is shrubby dry forest, in response to short interval fires. So in, short, in response to one high severity fire in 2013, and then to just six years of interval between 2007 and 2013. And there you see quite marked changes in the forest structure, and that's to do with re-sprouting failure, particularly of middle-sized stems, but also of um, less tree regeneration, as fires that came up in the uh, seedlings that came up in the first fire, after the first fire, are, are killed by the second. So Tom, this has flow on effects to all sorts of ecosystem services, including carbon storage. Tom assessed the carbon stored in the principal pools. This is the one of the main over uh, above ground pool is live tree carbon on the on the vertical axis again. And the different colours, each dot is a site, different colours representing uh, unburned forest in green, burned once in 2013 and then burned twice, 2007 and 13. And across the uh, horizontal axis, we have the site aridity index. So the site's getting essentially drier and hotter as you go from left to right. And what you can see is for comparable aridity, uh, you get a stepping down in the carbon stocks. This is three years after the last fire. So we can say here that short interval bushfires can markedly reduce carbon stores in mixed species eucalypt forests. And based on these data, but also other indicators, we believe that recovery of those carbon stores will take longer on drier sites. And we're seeing similar sort of transformations in the forest structure and in the tree layer in other forest types. This is um, more of Tom's work from the snow gum forests in Victorian Alps. Uh, and it's not a mixed species eucalypt forest, just dominated by one tree, the snow gums, but it is a re-sprouter. And you see there, Tom examined recovery after one, two, and three short interval fires, so three fires within 10 years, quite marked changes again in the forest structure, tree mortality, uh, decreased basal re-sprouting success and decreased seedling regeneration contributing to these changes. Alarmingly too, um, changes in the understory vegetation. So the characteristic shrub layer pretty much replaced by grasses after three short interval fires. And that really highlights something that I haven't had time to talk about here, but the importance of looking out for the biodiversity in our mixed species eucalypt forests. And much of that, the plant biodiversity at least, is in the understory. So we need to Keep an eye on not only the trees, but all the other plants. So just to sum up, yes, there are multiple potential threats, I think, to the health of mixed species eucalypt forests. We may have severe single events like those wind throw events in the wombat forest. But what I think we really need to look out for are compounded events where disturbances overlap in time and or space. Things like heat plus drought, severe fire plus drought, Severe fire plus severe fire plus severe fire plus drought. Thanks. <laughs>